answer bye bye. Feel a little pain turning. You will know a little fire is burning. And just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry. took me in Then a little light from heaven filled my soul Well, it made my heart in love And it wrote my name above And just a little talk with Jesus made me whole Now let us have, have a little talk with Jesus Come on, choir Tell him all about our trouble You hear our famous cry Let's survive and fire Feel the prayer will turn You will know that the fire is burning I have doubt and fear, my eyes feel a tear. Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. I go to him in prayer. Come on, sing. He knows my every care. And just a little talk with Jesus made it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Everything all right, well, all right, all right, all right, all right, just a little talk. Are you all ready? Come on, well, all right, 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 Jesus will make it right. Here we go. Jesus will make it right.
Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm going to go ahead up front this morning and preach the word. And uh, they'll come back in just a moment and do some more worship. We appreciate your prayers for Brenda. She had surgery this last Wednesday. I'm going to go ahead and bring my message this morning so I can go back and be at her side. She had, uh, she's having a good bit of pain. I have my daughter-in-law there with her right now while I'm here. We also had a hospice nurse out this morning. And uh, so I'm gonna go back and be with her. And I wanna go ahead and bring the word up front. I realize I need to be there with her, but I also realize I need to be here too. We have obligations in both places. So I want you to turn with me, please, in your Bibles. To Jeremiah chapter 17. Is it okay if I go ahead and do this early today? Okay. Jeremiah 17. As I told you a couple of weeks ago, I'm beginning a series. I preached a message on it a few weeks ago called The Arm of the Flesh and the Arm of the Lord. I'm going to make that part one that I preached a few weeks ago, and I'm going to stay on this probably for about the next four weeks. And I want to talk to you about some very important things that the Lord has been showing me in the scriptures concerning us doing things and letting God do things. There's a big difference. When you do things, they don't always turn out right. When God does things, everything turns out fine and lasts. But when we do things, a lot of times they're not lasting. They bring a lot of frustration. So I want to uh, make this actually today, this will actually be part two, arm of the flesh, arm of the Lord, and I'm going to have a subtitle that I'll give, but I'm not going to give it right now because I know how you are. If I give it right now, many of you will walk out on me. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'll save it because it's bad. That's why I'm preaching up front this morning while you're in a good mood so I can get it over with and Lyndall can come back and cushion everything with some sweet worship. <laughs> Jeremiah 17, verse 5, thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusts in man, and makes flesh his arm, and whose heart departs from the Lord. Did you know it's possible for your heart to depart from the Lord? It says, who trusts in man and makes arm his flesh, or makes flesh his arm, I'm sorry, and whose heart departs from the Lord. He shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parts places in the wilderness, in a salt land and not be inhabited. I, um, I think this is interesting. I'm going to just throw this in here real quick. I'm going to interrupt my scripture reading. When I saw this, I just thought about it. It says, the man that trusts in man and makes flesh his arm, his heart departs from the Lord. He shall be like the heath in the desert and shall not see when good cometh. I had a preacher call me this last week from a distant state. And he said, Pastor, I really want you to pray for me. I said, man, what's going on? He said, well, he said, we had a real move of God here in our church. He said it was really powerful. And he said, um, they brought me here uh, because they knew that I had affiliations with you and with the church there. And he said, we've had a just wonderful ministry. And he said, some of the very people that was instrumental in bringing me here, um, after I got here, their heart began to depart from the Lord. And he said, they just changed. It just, you could just see the change gradually over a period of time. And he said, um, it has really disturbed me to see how that their heart could so quickly depart from the Lord after being so on fire for God. And um, he said, we have had a series of miracles in the church. He said, uh, there's been a lot of people healed of 
all kinds of sicknesses and diseases. He said, matter of fact, several has been healed of cancer. Major healings of cancer. He said the doctor went in not long ago to operate on a lady and the tumor was completely gone. And even her blood that was severely affected and lymph nodes, he couldn't find a thing with her blood or her lymph nodes. He said it was just a miracle. And he said, these people have become uh, disgruntled with the staff. They, they like me. He said, they like me, they love me. But he said, they just become disgruntled. They don't like the different kind of music and they don't like this and that. And he said, I'm so hurt. I said, man, what's wrong? He said, well, last Sunday, he said, we had one of the most powerful testimonies I've ever heard given in my life. He said, a woman came and was given her testimony. She is a credible testimony, credible person. And God healed her. And it was so miraculous. It was so extensive, the way the cancer had gripped her body. It was just very extensive. And he said, God healed her body. And he said, while she was up testifying about her major healing in our church, he said those people were sitting there with their arms folded with a smirk on their face because they were disgruntled. And what the Lord showed me as I began looking at this scripture, let's look at it one more time. It says, Cursed be the man that trusted man and makes arm his flesh his arm, and whose heart departs from the Lord. It said he'd be like the heath in the desert and won't see when good comes. You see that? How many of you knows that was good, that woman up testifying? And they couldn't even see it when good came. That's disturbing. How many of you knows that God can be doing great and mighty things, and when your heart departs from the Lord and from the Spirit of the Lord, and you get back in the arm of the flesh, you can even be cynical against miracles and signs and wonders that God is doing in these days. I don't want that to happen to me. I don't know about you, but I don't want that to happen to me. And it's just said that he shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness and the salt land and not be inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. He'll be like a tree planted by the waters that spreads out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat comes, but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceptive above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now I'd like you to turn to John chapter 12. John chapter 12 and verse 38. It says that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled which he spake, Lo, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? I think that's enough scripture reading for the moment. I'll be going to some other scriptures here in just a minute in regard to this message, but I think that sets our teeth in what we need to hear today. Now, let me go ahead and tell you right up front what I'm going to be preaching on, okay? I'm going to be preaching on selfishness. Ooh. I'm going to be preaching this morning on the subject of selfishness. Amen. I feel bad vibes in the house. I just, I don't know what it is. I just feel husbands punching their wives and wives punching their husbands. And I, I can feel it right now. And I hadn't even started yet. This is going to be a major, major, major seller tape today. I can always tell how good it is when I get through. They say, Pastor, they bought that like crazy. The Lord, man, they just really ministered to them. I can just hear that next week, Pastor, they wanted a tape sold last Sunday. I can, I can just hear it. When you, when you begin to look in the scriptures, you see that there's there's ways that God has foreordained for things to happen. The arm of the Lord is the way that God intends for us to have lasting things, the arm of the Lord. Whenever God does it, it lasts. The arm of the Spirit and the arm of the Lord has eternal ramifications. 
It brings about peace, brings about joy and security. But the arm of man, the arm of flesh, is quite a different story. It's also an arm. It's also a way of doing things. But it leads to great frustration. It leads to loss. And it leads to an unraveling. I want to say that again. It leads to an unraveling. One of the ways that you can tell whether or not your life is predicated on the arm of the Lord or the arm of flesh is how solid things remain in your life. The things that God has blessed you with, the work that you have built, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I told you not long ago, just a few weeks ago when I preached the message before, I told you that the arm of the flesh when you get to heaven, there's going to be things that you're going to take with you to heaven that the Lord will allow you to take with you to heaven. But when God puts a certain fire to it, the arm of the flesh and the things that you did by the arm of the flesh is going to be totally destroyed. There'll be no reward given to you in heaven for things done by the arm of the flesh. Amen? The Bible talks about suffering loss. And... The things that's done in the Spirit and the things that's done by the arm of the Lord will reap a reward. God will honor you and bless you and reward you with eternal rewards. So I think that it's really important for Christians to take constant analysis and constant introspection and ask yourself regularly, am I still operating in the arm of the Lord? Or have I reverted to the arm of the flesh? I believe it's really possible in people's lives if you don't stay acutely aware to sort of bounce back and forth. You got to make up your mind to stay in that groove of doing what you do, saying what you say, empowered by the arm of the Lord. Now, I want you to turn with me to the book of Genesis, and this is a good place to start. Genesis 3. I'm Genesis 2, I'm sorry. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. And the Bible says, The Lord took the man, put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat of it you will surely die. And then the Lord said to man, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now there's a lot of different things about Genesis that I'm tempted to get off on rabbit trails right now and just talk about. I don't want to do that. I'd like to do it. But uh, one of the things I do want to say, when God originally created Adam and Eve, he created Adam out of the dust. He created Eve from the rib of Adam. And after God looked at them both, the first two human beings of the species of human beings, when God looked at them, the Bible said he called their name Adam. He called their name Adam. Did not call her Adam and Eve. Adam named her Eve. God called them both Adam. There's a lot of other things like that that I would like to say right now, but I've got too much ground to cover and too many scriptures to go to. But the one thing I want to point out to you, I'm talking about the arm of flesh and I'm talking about the arm of the Lord. Now, in the Bible, there's always a dichotomy. There's always a dichotomy. When God started out, everything was beautiful. Everything was good. Matter of fact, the Lord pronounced everything good. 
Since the fall of man in the garden, there is a dichotomy. You now not only have the kingdom of God, but you have the kingdom of the God of this world, Satan. You not only have blessings, but you have curses. You not only have life, you've got death. Not only do you have light, you have darkness. Not only do you have good, you have evil. And not only is there heaven, but there's hell. Now, as long as man focused on the tree of life and he wasn't in sin, his focus was totally fixated on God. Totally fixated on God. Man loved God. God loved man. They walked together in the cool of the evening. They fellowshiped. Man was put into the garden to dress the garden. And God intends for man to get fulfillment and pleasure out of what God has called him to do. I don't believe that God ever called a person to do anything that's sheer drudgery. Amen? I don't believe that God ever tapped us when we were born and said, you're going to live a life of hell. I don't believe that. I believe the scripture where it says, for the Son of Man has come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I think that we need to look sometime and really begin to examine what am I doing? Am I called to do what I'm doing? God's got a plan for my life. Am I in that plan or am I in my own plan? Am I in the will of God or am I doing my own thing? And whenever God placed man in the garden, man felt good about what he did. He was fulfilled. He was secure. And I believe that man and God in the cool of the evening talked about the things that God had called man to do. And I believe that Adam and Eve both really fellowship with God and thanked him for the opportunity to dress the garden and to keep it. I believe they talked about the animals. I believe they just really had great fellowship and got a lot of enjoyment out of talking about man fulfilling God's will for his life. God came down. It was God's earth, God's garden. Adam and Eve was God's. God just coming down to check on everything, look it over, and to fellowship with man. And man really felt good about it. But when Satan came and began to tempt Adam and Eve about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, another thing came into play. Now, as they partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, now no longer was there security and peace. Now there was really problems developed. Sin came in. Death came in. Joy departed. Now drudgery set in. Now the Bible says that man's going to earn his living by the sweat of his brow, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't have to go through all that. You know that as good as I do. But I believe that these two trees, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I wish I had time. I don't, and I'm going to try to do it later in another message. What in the world is the difference between the tree of life and then this other tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? What kind of good is it talking about? If the tree of life is so life-giving and so fulfilling, what does, what does it mean by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Is that good really good there? Or is it a false good? You know, I believe that man a lot of times looks at things that he thinks is good that's really not good. Self-righteousness is not good. See, there's a lot of people looks at the good works they do and they think themselves to be good and going to heaven, but that's not really good. Take a look at the tree of life and you'll see what's really good, amen? But I believe even the good in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is not really a revelation of good I believe that the tree of life is really what God's plan was, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil means that there's going to be two different lines coming into play here that's going to really bring man a lot of problems. I don't have time to stay on that because I'm on the arm of the Lord and the arm of the flesh. Now, the devil didn't just tempt Eve with the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
just because God prohibited that. But evidently, he tempted her with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because it actually contained some kind of a poison, like a type of a poison. Not only was it um, just plain disobedience to God and sin came in, but there was something that was loosed whenever they bit into that forbidden fruit. There was something that was loosed that God knew that was in that fruit that was going to spring up a source of information in man that was really going to mess man up. I wonder today, I really wonder today how many people still, even as Christians, still regularly tamper with that fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. I really wonder that. Now the Bible says that whenever they ate of this tree, God said, you'll surely die. And he knew that they would die in a lot of different ways, not just physically, because it took sin a while to kill them. But he knew they were going to die spiritually. And he knew they were going to die physically. He knew they were going to be messed up emotionally. God knew that. There was something to do with that fruit of that tree that literally would work like a poison that would mess them up for a lifetime, and not only them, but mess us up in succeeding generations that came from their loins. All of us traces our ancestry back to Adam and Eve, and we're all born into sin. So what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil does is it causes you to be distracted. It caused Adam and Eve to be distracted and diverted from the tree of life. And I tell you what I believe the tree of life is. I believe the tree of life is Jesus. Have you ever read in the book of Revelation that in the end that that tree of life surfaces again? You notice that? It causes us to shift attention from Jesus to ourselves. So evil is revealed as well as good is revealed. It drives us to corruption. We're corrupted physically, mentally, and spiritually, and all of that leads to death. Now the Bible says that the tree was found in the middle of the garden. It says that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was found in the midst of the garden, in the middle of the garden, and I believe that that's where self-centeredness started because this tree was right in the middle of the garden. It's a symptom of self-centeredness. After they eat of the fruit, ate of the fruit of it, their first response was self-inspection. Do you remember? As soon as they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which was right in the middle of the garden, it represents a diversion from the attention from the tree of life right in the middle of the garden. It's like a symbol of self being set up and right in the middle of things. As soon as their mouth touched it and their teeth broke the skin of that, immediately they inspected themselves. They never did that before. They inspected themselves and said, we're naked. There was a self-centeredness, a self-consciousness that developed in man that still plagues us all to this day. Self is one of the greatest battles that you will ever face. As a matter of fact, let me go ahead and make this statement. I personally believe that at the root of every sin is selfishness. Could you buy into that? Now, could I say it again? I personally believe that at the root of every sin lies selfishness, selfishness. Now, let me show you what I'm talking about. 
this is a sensitive subject. And after a while, I'm going to give an altar call at the end of this message, and I'm going to ask people to come forward. And some of you are really going to struggle about coming forward. I'm not going to give this altar call in such a way as to embarrass anybody or to make anybody stand out because there's going to be hundreds that's going to come forward. But if you're here today, or if you're watching by television or watching by tape or listening by radio, and if you have a problem with what I'm going to deal with today, at the end of my message, I'm just going to simply say this. I'm going to say, if this message has ministered to you and God has touched you in some way in regard to this sermon, I want you to come forward. That's all I'm going to say. This is a, a tough subject for people to sit and listen to because it affects every single one of us. Every single one of us is affected. I'm going to cover a lot of different areas in this message today. I'm not going to deal with this next week. I'm going to deal with it all today in regard to selfishness. And so whenever I get ready to give this call in just a little bit, I want you to boldly get up and come forward. And when you come forward, I'm going to give you eight points of instruction when you come forward. And we're going to look for some changes in all of our lives. Amen? So don't just sit out there and say, boy, I'm so glad my husband's here today. Well, I'm glad you're here today too, honey. And don't just sit out there and say, I'm so glad my wife is here today because, sir, I'm glad you're here too. You need to hear it as bad as she does. Matter of fact, probably worse. Now, whenever Adam and Eve had babies, they had Cain and Abel. It's interesting that Cain was a righteous man, or Abel was a righteous man, and Cain was messed up. Cain kind of represents the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Abel sort of represents the tree of life mentality. How many of you knows in all of us, there's that which is good. The apostle Paul said he struggled with it. He said, that which I would not do, I do somehow. And he said, that which I would not do, he said, I do it. And there's something in all of us that represents not only the tree of life, Calvary, forgiveness, redemption, revival, but there's also something in all of us, if we're not careful, that arm of the flesh and that tree of the knowledge of good and evil really has a tendency at times to emerge again, and you have to watch it. Now, the Bible talks about Cain and Abel. I, I think it'd be good if you'd turn with me there. Let's go to chapter 4. just want to show you something here. It's, it's sort of something that you're going to have to dig out, but I want to show it to you nonetheless. And let's take a real good look at it today. I believe that Cain and Abel represents the two different kinds of seeds that's in all of us. The Bible says in chapter 4, Adam knew Eve, his wife. She conceived and bare Cain, said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. She again bare his brother Abel. Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Look at it in verse 3. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought forth of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering, God had no respect. Cain was angry, his countenance fell. And the Lord said, Why are you wroth? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, you won't be accepted. Thou shalt not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now, let's look in verse 4. It said, uh, verse 3. It said, Cain brought forth of the fruit of the ground an offering. Let's look at that real close. Cain brought forth of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Look at the difference now in verse 4 of Abel's offering. Abel also brought the first of his flock and the fat. You know what I see there? You know what I see there? Look at it, everybody. Look this way just a moment. It says, Cain brought forth an offering. 
It said, Abel brought forth the first. You know what the first is? First is the best. It's an honoring. The first is the best part. The first is you look over and you got your harvest, you got your crop, and you say, oh, I want to give this to the Lord. I don't want to give him something that is marred. I don't want to give him something diseased. I don't want to give him something that's sort of rotten. And I, I don't want to give God something to an animal that has a blemish. Oh, I want to give God a spotless animal. I want to give him my very best. So he brought the firstlings. And then the Bible said he brought the fat. That means the best. But the Bible says that Cain brought forth an offering to the Lord, but it didn't say it was the best. He just took something and brought it to the Lord. Now, I know that we've heard it preached down through the years that the reason God had respect for Abel's offering is because he brought the firstlings of his flock and it was a blood sacrifice. Hey, I buy into that and I agree with that too. But you know what I also believe? I also believed if Cain, right off the bat, would have picked out the best of his, of his line of work. See, the Bible said he was a tiller of the ground. If he'd have picked out the first and the best of his part, of his work, I believe God would have accepted that also. Are you listening to me? And I believe God would have had respect for Cain's offering if Cain would have looked over his harvest and said, this apple goes to God, that orange goes to God, this watermelon, boy, that's a big, nice one, thump, thump. Oh, man, you know, and I'm going to give this to God. And he had brought that and lovingly presented it to the Lord because he was a tiller of the ground. That's what God called him to do. He was a tiller of the ground. And if he had said, here's my best, Lord, I believe God would have had respect for that. But he just took an offering. You see what I'm saying? Just took it. He said, here. Here you go. The scripture doesn't say this, but I tell you what I sort of suspicion here. I surmise this. I surmise that Abel kept the best for himself. I mean, Cain kept the best for himself and gave God sort of what was left over. How many of you know we don't do that to the Lord? God says we pay tithes on the first fruits. We pay tithes, we bring the best, we bring it to him. We give him the first fruits of all of our increase. Now, I won't take no more time with that. <clears throat> I believe that selfishness hinders in worship and I believe that selfishness causes the windows of heaven to close up over us. Now, I'm going to go through some things real quick. I'm just going to point out some things. I could point out a lot more. So don't come up to me after the service and say, you left out so-and-so. I just made a few notes here last night real quickly. And I want to show you where the problems that we read about in the Scripture, I want to show you what the root cause of all the problems was in the Scriptures. I just want to take a few. Let's look at Isaac and Rebekah. You remember them? Isaac was the son of promise. He was the one that Abraham took and offered up, and there was a ram caught in the thicket, and he was spared. Isaac is the type of Christ, of course. Rebekah was a wonderful lady, but she wasn't a perfect lady. Say that with me. Rebekah was not perfect. And they prayed, and they asked God to bless them. And the Bible told Rebekah, he said, okay, I'm going to give you children because they couldn't have any children. He said, I'm going to give you children. And God said, there's two nations in your womb. In other words, you've got twins. God said, there's two nations in your womb. And the Bible even says whenever those babies were born that Jacob had hold of Esau's heel. They were both in the womb together. And the birthright belonged to Esau because Esau was born first. But the Bible says one day after working hard in the field, Esau came in and he was hungry. He was tired and he was faint. And when he looked over and saw Jacob eating a bowl of pottage, Jacob knew that he was hungry and faint. And Jacob said, I'll let you have my bowl of pottage. I'll let you have my cereal if you'll give me your birthright. Now, I want to tell you something, friend. Esau sold his birthright for a stupid bowl of cereal. What's behind that? Say it out loud. Selfishness. 
Now, when it came time, the boys grew up. Esau really had it in his craw against Jacob because he got the birthright under such circumstances. It came time for Esau, or for Isaac, I'm sorry, it came time for Jacob to die. Isaac to die. I'm sorry, I'll get it right in a minute. Esau and Jacob. It came time for Isaac to die. And you know, sin, the one thing you have to watch out about sin, you may sow it yourself, but others will help you reap it. How many of you knows you can plow up a little piece of ground, till the ground, go out, make your furrows, plant your seeds, and you can plant it by yourself, but it's hard to harvest a garden by yourself. Usually you have to get other people to help you because the garden produces so much more than what you originally planted. Amen? And let me tell you something about sin. You may do your sin, but the first news you know, other people's going to be involved in your sin. And it came time for Isaac to die. And the Bible says that Isaac not only wanted the birthright, but he wanted his father's blessing. And his father knew that Esau was a hunter, and he was very hairy. And the Bible says that Jacob wanted his brother's blessing, not just the birthright, but he wanted the blessing. And he got his mama, Rebecca, to help him. And she made him real hairy, put fur on him, put the smell of venison on him, and went into his daddy. His daddy was blind, laying there, dying. And Rebecca was in on the deception, and Jacob usurped Esau's blessing, his dead daddy's blessing. And Rebecca was in on it. And it all tied in with the sin of selfishness. So many family problems today are tied in because of a selfish child that has learned to weave his little web and pit mama against daddy, pit, pit brother against sister, pit brother and sister against mama and daddy. It's selfishness. And selfishness has affected more families than you can shake a stick at. How many families can be happy today? Love one another, eat together, not only share a few holidays once or twice a year together, but could share regularly together. But they can't do it because there's so many schisms that has developed because of somebody's stupid selfishness. Are you listening to me? Mama favors him. Daddy favors her. And the first news you know, this one wants something the other one hasn't gotten. How many families have I seen tear apart over a little bit of inheritance? Mama dies. She barely died and had enough money to put her away. Grave and the casket. Just a little bit left over. How many families have I seen split over $1,700 left over after expenses? This one said, you've always had things. I want this. I deserve it. You've always prospered in life. Mama always loved you more than she did me. I deserve this. I. Me. Mine. You see what I'm saying? Are you listening to me? I told you, friend, worship's coming in a little bit. Just relax. Joseph sold into slavery. Why? Because daddy made him a coat of many colors. How many brothers did he have? They saw him decked out in that coat of many colors. Now I imagine it was a pr pretty pathetic looking sight because all it was is skins. You know. But it was a coat of many colors. And it wasn't so much what the coat looked like, it was what the coat represented. Daddy loved that boy. That's the boy from Rachel. That's my boy from the union I had with Rachel. And God's got his hand on him. The boy's seeing visions. He's prophetic. God's got his hand on him. The truth of the matter is, God had his hand on all of them. We still talk about 
about the 12 tribes of Israel, not just the tribe of Israel. It's the 12 tribes of Israel. But when they saw that coat of many colors, they just could not take it. And they got real upset. And they got real upset when they heard him talking about dreams and visions. And they got real upset. And the Bible said they sold him, put him in a pit, was going to kill him. One of them spoke up and said, no, let's don't kill him. Let's sell him. They sold him to a caravan headed into Egypt. They went home, told their daddy, said, here's that coat. Look what happened to it. Maybe some ravenous animal got a hold of him. And they lied to their daddy. That sin was committed because those brothers felt like that their brother was getting more attention and more of the love of their father than somebody else. Selfishness was at the root of it. I wonder how many church splits selfishness is at the root of it. I wonder how many choirs have split because sister so-and-so gets to sing all the popular parts. I wonder how many churches have split because the pastor pays more attention to this one than he does to that one. I wonder how many churches have split because they say pastor preaches more to this side of the church than he does that side of the church. <laughs> that lady come up to me one time and she said, Brother Kilpatrick, I got a question for you. I said, what is it? Shoot. She said, you always favor this side of the congregation. And she said, I sit over here and they see you all the time. We don't ever get to see you. And she said, I have even moved over here and you favor this side. She said, what is it? Do you not like me? I said, lady, I don't even know you. She said, you preach over here on this side. She said, is your brain more geared over here on this side? I said, my brain is evenly balanced, lady. I may have an inner ear problem, but my brain is fine. And she said, well, we feel deprived over here. I said, I'm going to make a point of it. I'm going to make a point of it. to really start focusing over here. She said, just look, the carpet is more worn over here than it is over here. You know what I wanted to say, sweetheart? If that's your only complaint, this church is in great shape. If that's your only complaint, amen. Oh, Jesus. <clears throat> Linda will do good when I leave, okay? What happened to David? He got into selfishness. He looked down at a time when kings go to war and he saw a woman bathing. And here's what he said. I want her. I want her. And you all know the story. He brought her in, made his attendants leave the room. He laid with her got her pregnant, had her husband Uriah sent to the front lines of battle, had him killed. He was guilty of adultery and murder. He got into selfishness. And it brought a blight to David. But as you read in Psalms 51, the wonderful thing about selfishness is David repented of it and got back in the spirit. And he said, God, I have sinned, and against thee only have I sinned. And Lord, would you please forgive me? And he really repented, and God forgave him. He forgave him of murder, and he forgave him of adultery, and left him as the king of Israel because he really had his heart smitten because he realized he had moved into the arm of flesh from the arm of the spirit, and he moved into the arm of flesh, and he repented of it, got out of the arm of flesh, and moved back over in the arm of the spirit. And God continued to bless David, but he had a life full of woes. Let's look at Jonah just for a minute. I'm just picking out a few. But just stay with me for a minute. What in the world happened to Jonah? God said, Jonah, I want you to go over to where? Nineveh. Nineveh. Jonah said, mm-mm, that's not in my plans. 
He said, I'm going to catch a ship and go over to Tarsus. And you know, the interesting thing about that is a storm had to come up to affect everybody because of Jonah's stinking selfishness. How many times do things come up that affects a whole church, that affects a whole family, that affects a whole bloodline because somebody got in disobedience against God because they wanted what they wanted. Are you listening to me? And a whole ship. Matter of fact, them old boys was wiser than that boy was that was supposed to be a man of God. And they started casting lots and they said, oh, you're the problem. <laughs> Threw him over. And you know something else? God had a fish prepared. Isn't God merciful? Yeah. Even in our selfishness, God let a, a whale with a big Evan Rude motor on the back of it just cruise up to him. A mechanical arm said, like that, and swallowed him up. No, I'm kidding. The whale swallowed him because of his selfishness and his disobedience to God. And you know what? God caused that fish to spit him out. But even when that fish spit him out, and even when he was forced to do what God told him to do, he still didn't want to do it because he didn't want to see the people repent. And he was sitting out there, you remember, and God let that gourd come up. He's over there pouting because the people repented and he didn't want to see them repent. Have you ever seen people in church pout because God did something and they didn't want God to do it because they didn't think they deserved it? Well, shoot fire. Let me get back to my notes then. I can just tell. Let's look real quick. Watch this. Turn to Matthew 20. I'm not going to stay on this much longer. But go to Matthew chapter 20. How many of y'all despise a spoiled brat? How many of y'all like to be around a spoiled brat? How many of y'all like to be around somebody that's always tooting their own horn? bragging on themselves. Do you? Why did it get so quiet? You don't toot your own horn, do you? <laughs> you know, one of the things I love about the Bible is if you ever encounter anything, you can always find it in the Scriptures. You can always find it in the Bible. Do you remember the mother of Zebedee's boys? <laughs> <laughs> Look at Matthew 20 and verse 20. Then came to Jesus the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him. How many of you know you can come to church with ulterior motives, worshiping while you come? And the Bible says she was desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, Lady, what can I do for you? And she said unto him, I want you to grant that my two boys may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. Now let me stop right there and say this. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can't you imagine Jesus had a, straight, had a hard time keeping a straight face like, are you serious? <laughs> Look in verse 22. <clears throat> Jesus answered and said, Sister so-and-so, you don't know what you're asking, Sister Zebedee. Are you able to drink the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? And the boys then spoke up and said, Mm-hmm, we are. And the Lord said unto them, Okay, you will indeed drink of my cup. How many of you know he's trying to tell them something there? You will indeed drink of my cup, buddy. And you will be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. It's going to be given to them to whom it's prepared to my father. And I want you to look at verse 24. This is so humorous to me. It said when the ten heard it, <laughs> the other ten disciples, when they heard this, they were moved with an indignation against those other two disciples. You ever read that before in the Bible? It was like they said too. <laughs> when they saw those disciples bring their mama in and talk to Jesus, 
Say, Jesus, these are my boys. These are my babies. I love them. I want you to fix it to where one of them can sit on your right hand and the other one can sit on your left. What does that do to the other ten disciples? What kind of predicament does that put them in? It's like, my boys are better than they are. My boys are wiser than these other ten. My boys are more spiritual than these other ten. And Jesus, I'd really like for you to fix it where one can sit on your right and one can sit on your left. And the Bible said when the ten heard that, they were moved with indignation. In other words, their nostrils flared, and they were in a bad mood for the rest of the day, I would imagine. <laughs> Do you see how a woman came in and confronted Jesus and brought division? Over what? Selfishness. Selfishness. Let me hurry on. What caused the death of Jesus? Selfishness. Judas went to the chief priest and he said, how much will you give me for him? I know you're looking for him. I know where he is. I know his habits. What will you give me for him? They said, we'll make a deal with you. We'll give you some silver, but you must turn him over to us at a certain time and a certain place. Judas said, I'll have him there. And they, he turned Jesus over to the enemy and they gave Judas 30 pieces of silver. I want to stop right here and say something. Friend, that is the epitome of selfishness when you sell out a friend for money. How many have sold out their parents? How many have sold out a brother or a sister? How many have sold out a colleague? How many have sold out a co-worker? How many have sold out a friend, a dear friend? over stinking money because you're more interested in your welfare than you are the welfare of others. And he sold Jesus out. But how many of you knows when you do that kind of thing, you won't live to enjoy your money? It's wrong money. You'll never be able to spend that money, build you a home, have you a nice car, wear the finest of clothes, and enjoy it because there's something that has tainted that money that you'll never enjoy it. Why? It's the arm of the flesh. And the arm of the flesh will never prosper. Are you listening? What about the prodigal son? I mean, just keep going. I'm just taking a little bit of time here because I want to show you something. What about the prodigal son? He came to his daddy and he said, Daddy, I want what I have coming to me. I don't care about you. I don't care about your investments. I don't care if you have to take things out of the bank, mess up your income. I don't care what you have to do. Daddy, if you love me, I want what I've got coming, and I want it now. And you know what? Daddy gave it to him, but how many of you knows when you get wealth under those conditions, you never enjoy it? Wealth that is hastily gotten and wealth that is ill-gotten flies like a bird and you can't ever catch it again. It's gone. But when God blesses you with wealth, it's solid and it'll last you for a long time. The money that God blesses you with causes no sorrow. But the money that you get because of selfishness and not thinking of others and not doing what's right and not by incorporating others and incorporating your family and incorporating other people and sharing like you ought to share, fair shares, you won't enjoy it. And the Bible said that the prodigal son said, I want what I got coming to me, and I want it now. His sin was selfishness. And then the older brother also had selfishness all over him. Both them boys should have had their rear end spanked. Amen? Daddy should have took them both to the woodshed, worked on them both the same. Come here, boy. Wow. He really ought to work on the old spiritual boy. I do hate to hear somebody crying the blues, don't you? <laughs> you never have always been here with you. I've always <laughs> And the daddy said, but you, I'm here with you always, and everything I've got is yours. And the boy said, that's not good enough. I mean, he knows when you get into self, nothing is good enough. When a man gets so spoiled, 
His wife will never please him. He, she may pet him every day. It's still not good enough. His pity goes deeper day by day. You've got to love me deeper. His wife's pity, you, oh, you're so depressed. You're depressed about a lot of things because the arm of flesh is falling apart. And whenever the pity comes, the pity never drills quite deep enough to get the gush that you want of sympathy. And so your whole family is tied up trying to placate you and please you because you're so into self. And after a while, nobody can pet you. Nobody can pamper you. Nobody can give you enough sympathy. You're one of these cases that nothing is good enough. Man, you need to repent. Are you listening to me? It's getting quiet in here now. I told you it would. I warned you ahead of time. It's getting quiet. Oh, Jesus, I'm hurrying. I've only got one more. Let's take the first sin after the Holy Ghost was poured out. They're bringing their money before the apostle. Is this all? Ananias and Sapphira said, that's it. The apostle said, why have you lied to the Holy Ghost? Now, I want to tell you something, friend. Listen to me just a minute. Look. Everybody look this way just for a minute. God blessed them with the land. Did you know if you don't handle your blessing, blessing right, it can become a curse to you? God blessed them with the land. Handle your blessings with care. Handle your blessings correctly, and they will continue to be a blessing. But if you don't handle your blessings correctly, they can instantly turn into a curse to you. God blessed them with the land. And they said, is this the money for the land? And they said, yeah. And the apostle said, why have you done this? There's no call for this. God blessed you and gave you the land. Why have you lied to the Holy Ghost? Wham, he fell down dead, brought her in. Is this all the money? Yeah, this is all of it. Wham, she fell down to haul them out. Both dead, buried them. Why? Because they got that selfish greediness. You know something, friend? There's something about greed and there's something about the power of selfishness that it's a lust within itself. It's never satisfied. Whenever a, person's in, whenever a person is in lust, lust is a fire that burns. Lust is a fire that burns and it can't be satiated. Lust is not love. Love can be comforted and love can be appeased and love can have release. Lust cannot. And just as there's a lust sexually, there's also a lust in other things, including money. There's a lust for attention. There's a lust for sympathy. There's a lust for all kinds of things and it will not be satisfied. It burns and it'll drive you nuts. Why? Because it's of the arm of flesh. Amen? Amen. Whew. Now, let me, let me move on. Let me talk about unselfishness for just a minute, and then we're going to change the order of the service. Who's the people that goes down in history in glowing headlines? Let me just start off. I could take a lot of them. I'm just going to choose a few. Let's look at Ruth. You know what? I love Ruth. Naomi went into Moab. She lost her husbands there and her sons, and she was left with two daughter-in-laws. She heard they was bred again in Bethlehem, and she said, I'm going home. She came out. She was stripped. She had no husband. She had no sons. She had these two daughter-in-laws. They both were heathens. They both found them in Moab. Orpha turned back to her family and her gods and forsook Naomi. But Ruth followed Naomi out, and here's what Naomi said. She said, sweetheart, I love you. But she said, your mom-in-law ain't got no more babies in her womb. I can't give you no more. I can't give you another husband. I've got nothing left. I've heard this bread, and I'm going home. I'm going home stripped. Little old Ruth, I love her. She grabbed hold of Naomi. She said, mom-in-law, you've lived a life in integrity before me. And I know you got something that I don't have. I love you. And she said, I tell you what, your God is going to be my God. And she said, your people 
will be my people. Let me tell you something. You ought not to ever marry anybody until you can say to the dad and the mom of the person you're marrying, your family will be my family. Your grandmother and grandfather will be my grandmother and grandfather. Your daddy and mama will be my daddy and mama. Your brothers and sisters will be my brothers and sisters. See, she didn't stomp her foot and say, well, I'll go with you on this condition. She said, your folks will be my folks. Your God will be my God. And she said, wherever you bury. And then the Bible said they set out. And because of the selflessness, not selfishness, but the selflessness of Ruth, the Bible said when they got to Bethlehem, they always left the corner of the fields for gleaning. And while Ruth was gleaning in the corner of the fields, she just happened to be gleaning in the field of a kinsman redeemer by the name of Boaz. And when he saw Ruth, his heart melted, not because of her beauty. I want you to listen to me, everybody. What I'm preaching to you this morning is not revival sermons. What I'm preaching to you this morning is day-by-day -day living sermons. And we need this. Are you listening to me? Sometime a guy's heart will burn after a woman's beauty and he'll say, man, she's a knockout. Whoever said you had to marry a knockout? Oh, he's so handsome. He's a, he's a hunk. Let him get some age on him. He'll sure enough be a hunk. Amen. Be good, John. Anyway, it's interesting. Whenever Boaz saw Ruth, he didn't see a striking beauty that knocked him down and said, wow. But he saw an inner character. How many of you know whenever somebody has inner character, they may be ugly to look at at first, but when you meet them and you get to know them, they're some of the most handsome and some of the most beautiful people you'll ever meet. You listening to me? I'm telling you the truth. I have seen some of these knockout chicks. You got the message, didn't you? I said I didn't have to say anything. And I've seen some of these hunks wind up to be punks. <laughs> Amen. That's not in my notes. That just came. <laughs> Under inspiration. Or either desperation of the Holy Ghost. I don't know which. Inspiration or desperation. I don't know what it was. But the Bible says that she wound up in Boaz's field. And when they tried to tell Boaz about Ruth, he said, no, I already know. The Lord's already shown me. And there's something about a selfish person that's repulsive. There's something about a selfish person that is so childish and so babyish and so spoiled and so rotten and so self-centered that it just repulses people. But there's something about a person that's not into selfishness, but they're into selflessness. You look at little Mother Teresa, little bent over thing, you know, her back's all bent over. Little old bitty thing before she died, had that head dress on, you know. Probably four foot something, probably wouldn't even weigh 100 pounds. But when she died, the world praised her name. You know why? Because she was selfless. She was selfless. I've seen other people that had beauty and wealth and died and didn't get near that acclaim. We can all think of names we can name, but what about her? What made her so popular? There's something in all of us, I don't care who we are, there's something in all of us that we admire selflessness, but there's something that we despise about selfishness. And one of the great tragedies is we often don't see selfishness in our own life. Sometimes we tend to think of ourselves in a way that people don't even see us. We tend to think of ourselves in a way that we think we're one way. When people see by our actions, we're completely a different way. 
let me hurry. Another person that was unselfless, the prophet came to her house. She was a widow. He said, where are you going, lady? She said, well, I'm going out here. I'm going to gather some sticks. I'm going to build a fire. I'm going to cook us a little piece of bread here. Me and my son's going to eat, and we're going to die. You know what the prophet said? Would you make me a cake first? She said, sure. You know what that meant? Sooner death than planned. Because she's going to make him a cake when she just said, we're going to eat this and we're going to die. If she'd have ate that, it would have extended their life some. But when he asked for it, she was actually giving up her life and her son's life to extend his life. You listening to me? And she went down in history, in the scripture, as a widow that gave the man of God a cake first and God blessed her. A selfless person. Let me also share something else with you, and I'm hurrying. What about the woman that had the two mites, and Jesus was in the temple, and everybody was bringing their offering? And Jesus looked down, and he saw what people were bringing. Isn't it interesting that God knows what we have? And when he saw that little widow woman, the Bible said he saw her come and bring her two mites, and she put them in the offering plate. The Lord said, <clears throat> can I have your attention, please? You see... The Lord knows that a lot of times what we give may be a large gift, but what we're left with is larger than what we gave. You may give $10,000 in the offering, but you live in a half a million dollar house. Are you driving a Lincoln? Are you driving a Cadillac? And you've got some dividends and some investments. You've got plenty of money left, although you may give $10,000 or $100,000. When people in the church see a gift of 100,000, they say, oh my. The Lord said, don't be moved and say, oh my, by some hundred, somebody's $100,000 gift because you don't judge the gift, you judge what they have left after the gift. Are you listening to me? And when this woman gave her two mites, she had nothing left. Selfless giving. She had nothing left. And the Lord said, oh my, I have just seen something here. He said, let me bring attention to it. He said, this little woman has given more than anybody in the room. They look and there's two little mites. And there's big gifts. There's some gold and all kind of stuff in there. And they said, Lord, how could she give more than anybody? He said, because she gave her all. You know what I found out? I've been in the ministry for over 30 years, been in a lot of situations I find out that a lot of times the widows are more apt to give an offering and not complain than a rich man giving the offering. I've seen my mother reach in her pocketbook and get her last dollar out many times. I was sitting by her in tent revivals and church many times. And I knew that we had tokens to ride the bus home on and that was it and we had three more days until she got paid. And I've seen Mama reach in her purse and pull out the last dollar. I knew there wouldn't be no hamburgers that night after service. I knew there wouldn't be nothing. If we got a snack, it'd have to be at home. Banana sandwich, a tomato sandwich, or something like that. There wouldn't be no crystal hamburgers for sure. I wanted the crystal hamburgers. Mama reached in and took that last dollar out and put it in the offering. And God bless that little thing. Because she knew this. I was raised like that, and I saw it. And as I grew up, grew up seeing that, God put something in my heart. I've seen the little widow woman, little widow, widow women in my churches down through the years give so cheerfully and give their last dollar. And a rich man be sitting out there, and if he had to put $20 in, and he had 2000 left in his billfold, he was griping about having to put the 20000 in. You see, there's something about selfishness that will get a hold of you real quick. I've got to quit. I'm going to show you one thing before I call you forward. I could get on the little boy's lunch, too. What did he do? Selflessly gave his lunch. I want to talk to you for just a few minutes about the symptoms of selfishness. The symptoms of selfishness. One of the symptoms is you've got to be in control. A selfish person has got to be in control won't participate when they can't call the shots. 
won't participate when they can't get the glory. There's a lot of times people will come in and examine a situation first, examine a program first to see whether or not they can get some glory out of it. If they can't, they won't participate. They'll criticize or rebel or bring down a leader to get their own way. Number two, another symptom of selfishness is disregard for the welfare of other people. They're so engrossed in themselves, they become insensitive to the needs of others. You know, when Reverend Booth, the head of the Salvation Army, was dying, they was having a big Salvation Army convention. And he was so low physically that he could not make the trip. And all the delegates and all the Salvation Army had gathered by the thousands to hear their leader, General Booth, give the inaugural address that night. And whenever they came to General Booth, they saw he was so sick he couldn't go. They said, we want you to write your sermon, dictate your sermon, we'll telegraph it to the delegates. Whenever the person got up before the delegation to read the speech, the sermon by General Booth, it was only one word. This was his last sermon. That word was others. Others. The last sermon he preached was a one-word sermon. Others. You know why people today are so miserable and why they're so lonely? Is because America has been into the lie, get what you can get while you can get it. You know, I gotta hurry because I got so many other things to say. The reason why there's so much depression today and so much loneliness is because people are living for themselves and they have not bought into what Jesus said and what General Booth said, others. The man knew the secret, others. I got so many things to cover here. Let me give you one more. <clears throat> A symptom of selfishness is you're obsessed with material things and possessions that can never satisfy. And I got a scripture here in Luke 12, and I won't turn to it. I know rich people that will even buy things they know they'll never wear, but they'll hang it up in their closet. Can I say that again? There's rich people that will buy things and put it in their closet that they know they'll never wear. They'll buy ties they know they'll never put around their neck. They'll buy blouses, they'll buy skirts, they'll buy purses and shoes that they know they'll never wear. But they've got such a materialistic lust and such a materialistic drive in them that although they know they'll never wear it and they don't really like it, they just got to have it. And it's a drive. And that's a major symptom of selfishness. And sometimes they'll even buy two pairs of one thing to have two pairs of one thing. Run up credit cards to the hill, to the max, to obtain things that they think will make them feel better and they have not learned in 20 years, it still doesn't make them feel better to have things. When are we going to learn? Things cannot satisfy you. Only Jesus can satisfy you. When are we going to learn that? A suit won't make you happy. A house won't make you happy. Things will not make you happy. When are we going to learn that? But that selfishness is so embedded and so enthroned and so entrenched in our life that it's just like a lust. It drives us hotter and hotter, deeper and deeper, and stronger and stronger. Until now, America is up to their eyeballs in credit and in debt and we're still miserable. You know, let me just say this. This is part of this point right here. Jesus said to that young man, son, keep the commandments. He said, I have. 
The Lord said, go sell everything you've got and give it to the poor. He said, sir, I'm real selfish. I can't do that. Now, he didn't say that out loud, but he did say it in his self-talk. Oh, I can't do that. Why can't you? Because I'm too selfish. I can't sell everything I've got and give it to the poor because I like what I've got too much. How many of you knows the Lord don't play around with us? He goes right for the juggler. Amen? Here's what I'd like to ask. I'd like to ask, while Lyndall comes back to the keyboard, every person in the Family Life Center and in this building, every person that has a problem somehow with what I have dealt with and God has spoken to your heart, I'm going to ask you to get up right now and come forward. Would you do that? Go ahead. Just stand here. Lord, this is my simple prayer. Come and purify me. Cause my heart to burn again. Fill it with your fire. Hallelujah. I cry out for your holy name. Bless you. Keep coming, friends. Cleanse this one heart. Come on, keep coming. Wash my shame and my brokenness. I surrender. I surrender. Lord, this is. and purify me cause my heart to burn again fill it with your fire I want to keep the altars open for just a moment I see I mean every aisle is packed I think all of us knew it would be like that because we've all got some areas in our life that really needs to be worked on. But just in case you're not here yet and you need to come, we're going to leave it open just for another few seconds. I'd like to encourage you to come, whoever you may be. If there's some things that you need to humble yourself over and put on the altar, bring to the cross. We're going to wait on you. in the choir, anybody that would like to come, wherever you may be. <clears throat> Here's what I want to do. I want to talk to you while you're here today. Before we repent, I want to talk to us about the remedy for selfishness. There's eight areas I'd like to cover, and I'm going to do them quickly. The first one is you've got to recognize it. Sometimes it's so hard to recognize something and to say, yes, it's true. I've got a problem with selfishness. Second, not only recognize it, but confess it. You need to tell somebody. You need to tell your spouse, your parents, somebody, especially God, I confess, I've really been a rotten, selfish person. And I am so sorry. The third thing is you need to repent of it. That means really have a heart change toward it and make up your mind you're going to be a different person. It's one thing to recognize something. It's quite another thing to confess something 
But it's quite another thing to actually get to the point that you repent of it and turn from it. You see, I don't believe that the Lord would tell us to repent of things unless it was possible to repent of them and change and turn. Amen? God can help you. God will help you if you're serious. The fourth thing is you need to look for situations to start practicing self-denial. Look for them. Now don't overextend yourself and don't go overboard and don't get into extreme thinking and say, well, I need to become a Mother Teresa. No, you just need to do more than what you've been doing. Start there and see how God leads you to go. But start looking for opportunities to deny yourself and where you normally would have spent money on yourself, now spend it on your family. Where you normally would have hoarded, now start giving. Where you normally would have turned your head, pay attention to the needs of other people. And not only pay attention to it, but do something about it. Look for a place to deny yourself. And I'm going to tell you what, your loneliness and your depression will just, whew, it's almost like there'll be an eraser. Uh, a hand just come and erase all that loneliness and depression out of your life. All of a sudden, you'll take on new meaning. There'll be a new breath in your lungs. There'll be a new atmosphere in your head. You'll see with different eyes. You'll hear with different ears. Your whole life will change. And number five, I want you to begin three things. If you're not doing it, begin to pray, begin to worship, and begin to praise. Let me tell you why these three things. Let me tell you what prayer is. You remember when the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us how to pray? You, you remember what he said? He said, when you pray, he said, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then here's where he ended it. He said, for thine is the power Thine is the kingdom, and thine is the power, and thine is the... You know what you've been used to getting? The glory. You know what prayer does? When you pray like Jesus tells you to pray, prayer makes sure that God gets all the glory, and you're robbed of it. Let me tell you something. Glory will corrupt you. The glory that belongs to God, you're not built for it. It'll corrupt you and make your life a miserable hell. Give God the glory. Amen? Now, worship. You know what worship does? Worship puts you in a place of awe. You know what? A person that's selfish is a horrible worshiper. A person that is selfish, you won't find them worshiping. You'll find them looking around, their arms folded. You'll find them doing all kinds of things. You won't find them on their face worshiping. You won't ever see their face wet. You know why? Because this has got to be the center of attention. This right here. Me. Me. I've got to be the center of attention. When you get into worship, you go into an atmosphere of awe. And you got your mind off yourself now. And now you got your mind on God. Now, the third thing about praise. Prayer, worship, and praise. You know what praise does? Praise gives God the glory for what he's done, not for what your arm has accomplished. Amen? Praise gives God the glory. Praise is when you thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for me. You know what? People that selfish feels like they're getting all this stuff accomplished and they don't ever give God the praise because they don't feel like God's getting nothing accomplished for them. They feel like they're doing it. They feel like their right arm has accomplished this. And so God doesn't get the praise. So let me just back up right quick and give them to you one more time. First thing is, Recognize it, confess it, repent of it, start practicing denying yourself, begin prayer, worship, and praise. Number six, learn to submit to God. Where you've always been rebellious and buck up against God, look for opportunities to now humble yourself and obey the Lord. Start obeying where you've always disobeyed. 
it'll be hard to do because you've got such a tendency now to buck God and to do your own thing. You need to put the brakes on. Remember this sermon. Put the brakes on and say, no, I'm going to obey God here. I'm not going to disobey him. And then seventh, start showing love to people. I hear so many selfish people say, I don't have any friends. Well, it's no wonder. You know why? Because you've always wanted self to be the center of attention. If a man has friends, he must show himself friendly. And whenever you start putting others before yourself and you start making yourself friendly, moving out of your little isolated sphere, loving people, sending cards, writing letters, moving around, shaking hands. How are you doing? How's your mama? How's your daddy? How's your family? All of a sudden, you're talking about others. Now you're not talking about yourself anymore. And then after you leave, that person says, do they really care about my mama? Do they really care about my daddy? I've got somebody that cares for me. And then they come back to you again, see? That's the way you do it. And finally, number eight, and I won't take much time on this one, but this is so important. You've got to start giving. Giving of your time, giving of yourself, and you've got to let that tithe go, and you've got to let that offering go, and give it to God. Because your giving is a actual barometer of what's going on in here. If you're selfless, that little wit of Cain, the last two mites, and Jesus said, oh, look at this. It's not so much what you give, friend, it's what you have left. And believe me, no matter what we give, we've always got plenty left. God's been good to us. Amen? But check your giving and make sure. Check it out. If you're tithing, it's a pretty good barometer. If you're not tithing, it shows that you're bound in selfishness. Are you ready to pray? Hallelujah. Extend your hands up toward heaven. Whew, hallelujah. I want you right now, everybody, just to lift your voices with me, and let's just pray to the Lord, everybody, on your own, and I'll pray for you. Come on. Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus, we need you, Lord. We need you, Lord. Touch us, Jesus. Touch us, Jesus. Touch us, Jesus. Touch the congregation today, Lord. Touch Brownsville. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Touch our lives. We humble ourselves before you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we humble ourselves before you in the presence of the Holy Ghost. Lord, prepare our hearts right now to receive your mercy and your forgiveness, Jesus. Touch us, Lord. Touch us, Lord. Hallelujah. I want to pray for you. Lord, we come before you today and we humble ourselves, all of us, Jesus. We ask you, Father, to look down from heaven and see our hearts. Lord, you know those that have come forward today, for some of them it's been extremely difficult to make their feet bring them down this aisle. Lord, some, even lately, a loved one or a friend or a family member has confronted them about selfishness in their life and they wasn't really willing to see it. But today, Lord, when it was talked about from the scriptures and the portrait was painted, when the cloth was pulled back, they saw that it was them. And Lord, we all stand today in the need of forgiveness for being so self-centered and self being in control. And we ask you, Jesus, today to have mercy on us Father, we confess out loud with our mouths that we need your forgiveness. We confess it out loud, Jesus. And we confess that we have been arrogant, 
full of pride, just what pleases us, not thinking of others, not even thinking about your holy name, Lord. But we ask you, Jesus, not to let our flesh be a stench anymore in your nostrils, but God, let us such a humility come over us that it will come up in your nostrils as a sweet-smelling savor, Lord. God, may we never repulse the Holy Ghost, but, oh, God, may your grace be extended to us because we humble ourselves like David did in the Bible. And he said, oh, it's me that's standing in the need of prayer. And, Lord, you let him maintain his kingship, and you blessed him, and you raised him up. And so, Father, today we ask you to forgive us. We ask that our families will forgive us, Lord, for being so self-centered. We ask, Lord, that our friends and our acquaintances will forgive us. And, Lord, today we lay the ax to the root. And as we leave this place, we ask for the help of the Holy Ghost to remind us in these next days, remind us when we get right back in that same old mindset and we feel ourselves slipping again, Lord. Let the Holy Ghost prompt us and prick our conscience and say, no, don't do that now. Humble yourself right now and do what's right. And Father, we ask you for mercy and grace in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you, friends. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hallelujah. As you move back to your seat, we want to go to the Lord in communion. Let's be sure and not leave yet. Because one of the things you need to do right now is bring all this that the Lord has dealt with you about to his table. And again, not be selfish. Let's remember his death, all right? As you return to your seat and the brothers bring communion to you, let's sing this. I need some help. Thank you. I know a place, a wonderful place, where accused and condemned find mercy and grace, where the wrongs we have done and the wrongs done to us were nailed there with him there on the cross at the cross he died for Everybody sing and focus your attention on the Lord, all right? Lift up your voice now. Sing, I know a place. I know a wonderful place where accused and condemned find mercy and grace. And the wrongs we have done, and the wrongs done to us. If you've been served communion, you may stand. If you haven't been served, please remain seated.
times we come to communion and we assume that everyone understands what we're representing here. I had a friend one time who had a lot of bitterness in her life and she had had a lot of reason, I guess, if you have a reason for bitterness because life had dealt her some pretty sorry things. She find herself broken. One day the pastor was saying, you know, when we come to the table of the Lord, we bring our brokenness to the table of the Lord because we know that in the remembrance of his death, Christ's death and his resurrection is the only hope that our brokenness will be healed because his body was broken, we can be healed. Because he was pierced and his blood was shed, we can be saved. Healing is not just for the physical, it's for the mental and emotional too. As they're continuing to serve you, this week and today as pastor has spoken to us, if you have felt the convicting power of the Holy Ghost, and right now you pick up this cup and this bread and you feel like you're totally unworthy, you are. But the fact that we don't rightly discern the body does not mean that we should run from this moment. But it means we need to run to this moment. The people in this building with the most brokenness and the most undoneness need this more than anybody else. Because in the death of Jesus is your healing. And in his blood is your forgiveness. And by remembering his brokenness, we remember that because he was broken, we can be whole. So today as we take of these elements that represent the broken body of Christ, the bread which represents his body, and the grape juice that represents his blood, we remember him and we put his face in our face and we put the cross before us and we say, Lord, because you were broken, I may not see my healing right now, but I'm healed. And because you were slain like a lamb before the slaughter, I am redeemed and one day I won't be eternally separated from God, but because of your blood, you made a way for me, a sinner, to be a saint. I think this is a solemn occasion, but I also think it's a good reason to rejoice. I said I think it's a good reason to rejoice because in your hand you hold what represents your redemption. When your hand, when you remember his blood, you are drinking what represents the reason you're saved. You weren't saved because of your works. You were saved because of his gift. And it's not works that any man should boast, but it's faith and grace in the Son of God. Thank you, Jesus, because you died. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I wonder if somebody could take some of that Sunday morning stern off of their face and look up to Jesus and say, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lift up the bread right now to him. And say, thank you, Lord. 
Thank you because you were broken. Thank you, Lord, because you allowed your body to be broken for me. That I can be whole. Thank you, Lord, that you went to hell for me and took the keys of death, hell, and the grave away from Satan so I don't have to go to hell. Thank you. Thank you for your body, Lord. Your beautiful body broken for me. Thank you. Now say this with me. Jesus, we remember. Father, thank you. Let's take the bread together. Oh, yeah. Oh, Jesus. I love you so much, Jesus. Oh, I love you so much, Jesus. Hallelujah. Take the cup now. We understand this is just an element. It's just a representation of a spiritual thing. This is not the actual blood of Jesus. This is a representation. Somebody said, why would you drink blood in church? We do this in remembrance because a commandment he gave us that as you do this, remember the blood that was shed. Jesus, we know that the paintings that have been made of you looking like a white European man are probably not exact. And the few little puncture wounds that they show in those paintings don't even come close. Because the reality, Jesus, is if we actually saw your body broken and bruised and beaten as it was, it would be such a horrible sight. We wouldn't want to hang it on our living room wall. But you did it nonetheless, Mark. You took a beating for us, Lord. And Jesus, we remember your blood. The power of your blood can save and heal. And Satan can't cross this line. And Jesus, by this blood, you made us a way to you, a way to access the Father. Thank you. Now say this with me, church. Jesus, we remember. Father, thank you. Thank you. Now let's take it together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know that Pastor Kerry has probably got an announcement, but before we leave, let him make this announcement and say what he needs to say to you. I think we should leave with a good chorus. Since we've worshiped the Lord and remembered his brokenness, I think we should leave here worshiping him, don't you? Pastor Kerry. Probably what we've just done, the celebration of communion reminds us of the selflessness of Jesus Christ. In the garden for just a fleeting moment, he said, Father, let this cup pass from me. But it was just a fleeting moment. And almost in the same breath, I believe in the same breath, Lyndall, he said, nevertheless, forget about my will. That's right. Thy will be done. And even on the cross, when he was hanging there, he looked out over the people that were witnessing and some of them were jeering and, and uh, ridiculing and everything. And he said, Father... Father, forgive them. He wasn't thinking about himself. He was thinking about others. And, um, you know, this, this message Pastor preached today is, is so, so appropriate, you know. I, I just, uh, it, it just grips me because we are selfish. We're selfish with our time. We, God asks us to do things in service for him. So I, I, I don't have time. I'm too tired and too busy. Listen, friend, we're never too tired or too busy. That's selfishness. And I just pray that God would grip our hearts today as a people. God's entrusted something special to Brownsville.
He's entrusted something special to Brownsville. And I hope that, we're not, we, that we'll never get so selfish that we'll say, well, you know, I just can't, I can't embrace what God's trusted to us. God's given us the ability to impact a city and a world. And he's given us the plan to do that. And we can do that if we'll turn to him with all of our heart in devotion and surrender. And that's what the communion is about. It's a demonstration of Jesus doing exactly that for us. If he did that for us, we can surely do, do something for him. Praise God. Listen, uh, Brenda's going to be incapacitated for the week. And I really would like to. I should have done this sooner. But um, I tried to take care of it over the, the weekend up until today uh, through doing personal things. But um, I, I would like uh, for, um, uh, for us to provide uh, meals this week for Pastor. And here's what I'd like. I, I, I know that all hands are going to go up all over the place. But I want five of the best cooks. If, if you can't cook, lady, don't, hand, don't put your hand up. Okay. But I need five of the best cooks to prepare a meal and bring it to the church, and we'll see that it gets there. I need it, I need it here by 1130 every day this week, five of the best meals, okay? And so, Father, let Revelation come to this congregation right now and let five of the greatest cooks and, and give me discerning spirit, a discerning spirit, Lord, to be able to pick those five ladies out in the name of Jesus. Uh, I would like to see Pastor and Brenda with, with the most delectable meals they've ever eaten in all of their lives. I'd like for those meals to be provided for them to, uh, this coming week. And so, um, uh, ladies, in deep humility, <laughs> in deep humility, I'd like five, five, five ladies that would, uh, would raise your hand and say, I'll, I'll provide a meal for it and bring it to the church at 1130 uh, every day. Okay, now I'm, I know that. I made it tough. All right, Doris Bork, I believe you. And lady, you look like a good cook to me. I don't know. But Helen, I know you can cook. That's three. Where? Who? Who? All right. That's, I know she can cook because she slipped me a couple of little goodies one night time. And I'll tell you what they were. They were turkeys stuffed with some of the most delectable stuff that you've ever eaten in your life. And, um, and, um, huh? and Judy will do it. Okay, that's four. I she think. Can cook, I know that. Huh? Judy can cook. You know, know that. That's how she got this job. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wait a minute now, Judy. What about me? I mean, I'm getting selfish here now. What about me? <laughs> no. <laughs> Take good care of uh, of Lyndall. Uh, okay, sis. All right. Thank you so much. Don't you love our pastor? And his wife. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I want Richard to come. He's going to lead us in a prayer for Pastor and Brenda uh, for this week. Pastor's not traveling this week. He's staying home uh, like a good husband, taking care of his wife. And that's good because we don't want a divorce. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, these are wonderful, wonderful people God has given to lead us. And so... I want you to stretch your hands toward Richard. He's going to stretch his hands toward you, and we're going to agree that this is going to be a great week for Pastor and Brenda. Um, lip, one, one detail, though. We don't want them all for serving those meals tomorrow, so do they need to contact okay. the church as to which day they're going to cook? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I'll tell you what. Let's call them Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, who will do it Monday? Show me the hand. Okay, Doris. Tuesday, Helen. Wednesday, Thursday. Friday, all right, we cover. Okay. Thank you. If you will extend your hands toward the heavens. Father, Lord, we thank you so much for Pastor and Sister Brenda. We thank you, Lord, the surgery went well this week. Lord, we ask right now that you give Sister Brenda not only a speedy recovery, but Lord, that, Lord, that you would just relieve all pain in the name of Jesus. Father, we ask that you would remove all pain Father, we ask, Lord, that the surgery be far more successful than the physicians even imagined. And Lord, I pray that this week would be a, an incredible week for Pastor and for Sister Brenda. Lord, I, I, I pray that during this uh, difficult time, it would turn out to be a very refreshing time. Lord, a refreshing time for them personally, Lord, emotionally, spiritually, physically, in every way. 
Lord, we ask that you continue to anoint and bless and may the favor of God be upon them in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for this congregation, Lord, that's so supportive and Lord, a congregation of love and integrity. Lord, a congregation that loves the moving of God and the spirit of God. Lord, bless their homes. Bless BRSM. Lord, bless, Father, this congregation with your spirit. And Lord, help us to press forward, forward in you, Jesus, so that you may be lifted up in Pensacola yeah. and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Father, we lift your name up high, Jesus, and we give you glory and praise, for great is our God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. sing with you I will go you are my love you are my fair one the winter is past and the spring time has come I will go. Come on, Browns. We'll say it to him. With you, I will go. You are my love. You are. You are my fair one. The winter is past. Winter is past. And the spring. And the spring is
just one more time before we go. Come on, release your passion to Jesus. To the song of us. I love you, Jesus. Lindell, I don't, I don't ask you to, to do songs too often, but I, I want to ask you to do it's time. I, I just feel like that, you know, we're on the brink of something. I, I feel like that God has just got a time. And God's timing is important, folks. You can get ahead of God. You can get behind God. But I feel like if we can just zero in on God's timing, and I believe it's a timing right now, matter, and I, I just um, believe it's time. And I, I just want us to say that in, or sing that in faith. Would you do that right now? If it'd be all right, yes, would that sir. be appropriate? Yes, Whatever you Praise want. Praise God. It's time. It's time for the dead and gone. It's time for the broken ones to live again. It's time. It's time for the dead to rise. It's time for the wings to fly. Calling, I can hear the sound of rain over the mountains and over the valleys. I hear the calling, it's time. It's time. 
It's time, it's time to reach out for God, because he's doing a new thing. It's time for the dead to rise, and it's time for the wings to fly. For the numb to feel Oh, it's time for those wounds to heal
the Lord. Bless the Lord. Friday of this week, I'll be leaving for Rome and then Germany. I want you to pray for me. I'll be gone 19 days total. It's a long period of time, and uh, I need your prayers. So God bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord bless your rising up and your lying down, your going out and your coming in. May the Lord touch your hands and your lives to prosper in all that you do. And may the smile and the grace and the glory of God be upon you this week and indeed throughout the rest of your life. May your family be cared for. May everything you touch be blessed. May your witness be a bright and shining example to those you come in contact with. May God bless you and keep you. In Jesus' name, amen.